is Mike Schotter, and I'm the MC or moderator or whatever for the program this evening. Uh, I'd like to welcome all of you here this evening for this PTA-sponsored candidates forum. If I'm too loud or too uh, quiet, let me know. Um, it's certainly nice that we have seven of the eight candidates present tonight, so each of you can hear their views and learn something about them uh, before the voting comes up in a few weeks. And um, I will make a couple of announcements. First of all, part of our program is going to be that if the audience has questions, we're going to have index cards available uh, that you can write your question down, and there will be people that come by to collect the index cards, and then we'll have them up here and towards the end of the program, after we discuss some prepared questions, uh, then we'll have time for individual questions that way. I would probably ask you to make your, your question for the group rather than an individual, um, although certainly some individuals feel more strongly about uh, some issues than others, I'm sure. Um, I do want to introduce uh, uh, a special guest tonight, a person who's been very involved in not just the politics, but the success of the BTA program, not just in uh, Frederick County, but also uh, the state of Maryland. And that's uh, Debbie Boston who just uh, came in. Thank you. So much. Uh, we have, uh, like I said, seven candidates, and what we're going to do, we're going to give every, each one of them up to two minutes, just to briefly tell a little bit about themselves, what they represent. Uh, we do have a timer down in front, and 15 seconds before that uh, that two minutes is up, the timer will raise the index card. And uh, I would ask you at that point to kind of finish up your thought. Uh, I'll also remind you that there's nothing wrong with brevity. And if you don't have a long answer, that, that may get you a couple votes along the line as well. Um, let's start, we'll just go down the line. I'll, I'll kind of mix it up as we go along. But uh, let's start with uh, Mr. Jay Mason. Uh, you have your two minutes, Jay. Thank you, Mike. Appreciate it. Thank you for moderating tonight. Uh, thank you, PTA, for hosting us this evening. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, and I'd like to say that years ago when I entered uh, middle school, I went to middle and sixth grade. My parents um, had to advocate for me. I was put in all enriched classes, at, um, which is the middle of the road bit classes there. And my family was not um, acceptable of that. They didn't like it. So they went to the school and they said, he needs to be in all advanced classes. Um, we're not happy with him being enriched. So they advocated for me against my, uh, my better wishes. I was put in all advanced classes. It, it helped me. It made me a better person. Um, you get a much better education when you're put in the higher level classes. Um, several years ago, my daughter, going into seventh grade, a letter came home from school, and they asked uh, me and my wife if they wanted to put her, if we wanted her into the accelerated math program in seventh grade. And obviously we said yes. The school told us no. So we, uh, I almost sent an email, an angry email, but my wife stopped me. And we sent a simple email, and they again told us no. They did their, uh, their evaluation and said that my daughter was properly placed in honors level, which is still good. We were um, okay with that, but wanted her to accelerate. So anyway, um, they told us no twice. So I said to my wife, let's figure out how she does in honors in seventh grade, in honors math. So after her first semester, she got a 94 in honors math. And so I contacted the AP and I said, how do we get my daughter into accelerate? Math special again said, we feel she's properly placed in honors. And I said, that's not acceptable. She needs to be in accelerate. So my parents, my brother, they taught me to advocate. I'm a parent, I advocate, I have three children. I'm gonna teach my children to advocate. And I think being a parent, Engaged parent is uh, essential to their child's education, and that's what I want every parent in the Frederick County school system to be and do. Thank you. Ms. Merritt is next. Thank you, Mr. Shaw. And I, I also wanted to thank the PTA Council of Frederick County for sponsoring this. Um, it's a uh, we don't have a lot of opportunities as board of education candidates to. Um, to have forums like this. And so I also want to thank everybody who's taken time on a Tuesday evening to come and listen. And I also wanted to thank my fellow candidates. Um, I think this has been um, just 
we've had good opportunities. Um, and I'm running with people who are um, qualified and intelligent and committed. And I think conversations like this allow you to see some of the nuanced differences between candidates. But I can say that everybody sitting up here is committed to public education. And I, I think that's an important thing to say. I believe, I'm running um, for re-election to the Frederick County Board of Education because I believe in public education. I grew up on Main Street in Myersville. I eventually got out of Middletown High School. And along the way, I had teachers who um, really affected the tra trajectory of my life and made me committed to um, citizenship, to leadership, to push me out of my comfort zones. And um, probably are a lot of the reason why I'm sitting here today running for office once again in Frederick County. I thought long and hard about running again for Board of Education. It's a tiring, long, hard job, but I'm so committed to our public schools and to everybody who works in them and our families in Frederick County. When I joined the board in 2014, we were just still in the midst of a tremendous, tremendous financial crisis. We had been squeezed hard with maintenance and effort budgets. And I am so thankful to have joined the board with new leadership in county government, the commitment of our county executive and our county council to fund our public schools um, the way they should be funded. I committed very early on to um, improving salaries for our teachers and many other things, and I'm almost out of time, surprisingly. Um, but again, now that, now that the money situation is better, we have to focus on continuous improvement. And that's looking at places we're doing things well and things we need to do better. And I'm going to looking forward to elaborating on some of those answers. Thank you. Have a chance. Thank you. The next candidate is April Miller. Thank you. Thank you all for being here and taking time to come and share your thoughts on education through your questions and to listen to ours and to listen to what our passions and priorities are with education. Um, this has been quite the journey. I moved to Frederick County when I was in fourth grade. And quite, Jay and I actually may look a little different, but we have quite a similar story. In when I was in middle school as well, I was also placed where I found it a little bit easy, and I had to advocate for myself, and I had to fight for myself. And one of those reasons is because I was put um, a label was put on me, and one of those reasons was because I talked too much. But that doesn't stop me. That label didn't define me, and I kept fighting, and I found what I was passionate about, which at that time was science. And that led me to high school and fighting to take the courses I wanted to take in high school and through college and to find that path. And that's what I want each and every kid, each and every student in our school to be able to find their passion, find what they love, find what they love to do. And that's why I'm here because that comes in all different pathways. And whether it's high academics or whether it's career, it's a multitude of offerings that we have in Frederick County. And I'm very proud to be a part of that and be increasing those offerings every single year. Um, I have three children, and my oldest is now a sophomore in college. When I started on the Board of Education, she was in sixth grade. When I started running for the Board of Education, she was in fifth grade, and we had something called Turf Math. And Turf Math might not mean something to you, but it was common for even worse math. The reason why I fought for that is because the community didn't like that math program, and our Board of Ed, at that point, was not listening to the community, I felt. So I wanted to make a difference, and I wanted to have an impact on the Board of Education. And so I, oh man, already? Jeez, I'm really sorry. Anyway, I look forward to talking to you more. I'm almost out of time. <laughs> um, my biggest, biggest success for being on the Board of Education is bringing that community, and that community perspective, and being the voice of students and families on the Board of Education. And that's one of the things I'm most proud of. <laughs> Thank you. The next candidate is uh, Camden Rayner. Thank you very much. And I want to, again, first and foremost, thank you to PTA Council for putting this together tonight, as well as Frederick High School for hosting us. I have not yet had the opportunity to see this new beautiful building, and it is stunning. Uh, especially, I went to middle, this is amazing. <laughs> in every way, it's wonderful to see as a flagship school in our county. Uh, for some background, I look a little different. I'm the youngest candidate up here, but I have, again, I have a middle school story as well. We'll get to that in a second. But I was born and raised here in Frederick County. I'm honored to be a fourth generation middle time graduate. I was raised in Myersville. I'm a 2016 graduate of Middletown High School. I'm currently at the University of Maryland. We can talk about that later. But in middle school, I grew up, they talk about the funding crisis, and I grew up at a time, I was in the school system during this really tough recession. That was before an event in my childhood. I remember, back in 2010, <laughs> writing emails to uh, Mr. Young and Dr. Miller, begging him not to cut outdoor school in sixth grade. 
I have a long history of civic engagement in this county. We need people of all ages and races and then to step up and run for office. I was not interested in waiting my turn to be up here. We need people to step up and say, I want a voice and I think I want to vote and have public education centers are made in Frederick County. I am committed to this county. I've lived here my entire life. I hope to stay here. And um, I'm looking forward to having a meaningful conversation about the future public education in Frederick County. Thank you. Next is Mr. Brandon. Yeah. Thank you. Is it on? Yeah. yeah. First off, I also want to thank the PTA for hosting this event. Ms. Barrett said we only had a few of these events, so it's good to be able to get out and be able to talk about the issues. I also want to echo the thanks to all the folks that are sitting up here on the stage, everyone here is committed and in their heart supports public education. And I want to thank my fellow candidates for uh, this microphone is not working. I have a lot in my background compared to Camden. I was born to two elementary school teachers. My mom was a second grade teacher, my dad was a fifth grade teacher. And so I was taught early in my life the importance of education uh, and how important it was to be the great equalizer in our society, education allows people to go on uh, and do great things. So from that, I, when I got out of college, I got involved in the community. I served 15 years on our board of Frederick Community College. Uh, I started volunteering in the schools. I had three daughters that all went through Frederick County Public Schools. I was very active with their uh, educations as they went through uh, Walkersville, uh, schools in Walkersville High School. I went on to also serve on the state and national board of community college trustees. I uh, was appointed by the Chancellor University of Maryland and served six years on the universities at Shady Grove. But I wanted to get back to our public education system, so I ran uh, in 2010 and was elected. And some of the big issues that I had, my background, my business, I run a financial planning and investment management practice, so obviously the budgetary pieces were very important to me. But also the funding pieces, as Camden said, we went through my first four years on the board with zero increases in funding. It's very tough to run a school system with that. And so uh, if I'm reelected, my three top um, uh, areas that I want to focus on are finishing our, our salary transition for our teachers and our employees to the new scale, scale public safety and safety in our school systems, and the links program that was started here at Frederick High, which I think has shown outstanding results so far. I want to see it continue to hear and spread throughout the county, so thank you. Thank you, now Karen Newman. Good evening, let's see if this mic works. Um, thank you for having us, thank you for coming. It's wonderful not to speak to an empty room, but even if there was just one person, um, it'd be great to talk to you, and this is more than one person for sure. Um, I retired from 25 years of teaching in June, and people keep asking me, so what's retirement like? I will let them know on November 7th. Um, and campaigning certainly has kept me busy. It's been a lot of fun. I have enjoyed it. I'm also uh, working for my husband, which I've done. It starts my 10th year. So I've gone to half time teaching the last nine years. So my head's been filled with getting him licensed in another state today and uh, shifting now to education matters. Um, I started, a, came into teaching actually a little different than a lot of people. Most people were, I love that teacher, I want to be like that teacher. I had a teacher that really did a disservice to the students in sixth grade. I kid you not, we did math once a week. I always say whether we needed it or not. Obviously that left us very void of skills for middle school. It took me years to catch up. I didn't even think I was good at math. My father's a, a nuclear physicist and my kids are accountants, so um, there are math genes there. Um, but I left high school. My plans in my yearbook were to stay as far away from school as possible. I jinxed myself. I went to college, got my teaching degree, substituted. I was a PTA president. Um, you know, I had three kids and, and then became a teacher, so I never left school. Um, but public education, I have a passion for it, and it's what I know. And um, I just didn't want to go off and, and retire. I wanted to be the voice of the classroom, along with Mike Vanitsky. Sorry that I, I 
bumped him out last time. He does a great job. Um, but I have elementary experience, and I want to be that voice for the students and teachers. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Kim Williams. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Mike, very much. I appreciate that. Thank you to the PTA Council and also Frederick High School for hosting us. Um, and also to you, each and every one of you, taking your time to come out to talk with us, hear us, uh, which is very important, both, both sides. We're talking, you're listening, you're listening, you're talking. It's, it's critically important. I'd also like to say thank you to fellow candidates here. Um, this is a lot of work. It's what we all, apparently, we're all very committed to public education, so I'm happy to be here with these folks. Um, I am a mother of three grown children that were raised here in Frederick County Public Schools, and I have five young grandchildren, three of them in Germany, and, and two of them are here. Um, I am a Navy veteran. I'm a Christian. I've been a past PTA president at several schools here in Frederick County Public Schools. I've close to 30 years here in Frederick County volunteering um, every avenue. I've been president, the vice president, I've been treasurer. I was at the school so much, people thought I worked there. It's just, I have this passion for students and, and, and not just the run of the mill student, every student, especially the underdog. I'm really passionate about that because for a lot of kids, my, my children do, um, they were okay, they were well taken care of, but it's, it's for those kids that come to school and want to do the best that, that they can with, with very little. Um, I have three things that I'm interested in talking about, and one of them obviously is the salaries, which without the money, we really can't do anything, and since uh, they initiated the, the salary increase with the staff and the teachers, that's very good. Also, safety is very important. We need to collaboratively work with everybody in the in the county, the county executive, uh, the sheriff, the police, police department, to keep our children safe. And diversity is my last issue. I'd like to see more diversity, not in the schools, because there's plenty of diversity in the schools, but on some of the boards that we have in Freddie County. Thank you. Thank you. Ironically, we're going to come back to your three priorities in just a moment. Um, what we're now going to do, we have some prepared questions, and uh, we'll move around a little bit, so each candidate will have a chance to be one of the first people answering the question. But in this case, you'll have 90 seconds, and you'll still get your 15-second uh, warning. So uh, I'll mention the question, but if somebody didn't hear it correctly, let me go out and say it again. The first one, we'll start with uh, Dr. Milton. Um, the first question is, if you are elected to FCPS school board, what are your top three priorities? Okay. Um, I have three priorities coming forward. Um, one is, they're very broad, because I like to put a lot of things into it. So the first is infrastructure. And by infrastructure, I mean not only the building but that we're sitting here, but also I consider infrastructure, the technology, everything we need to keep our school system running. So the infrastructure to me also means safety and security. We have been, uh, have a focus on safety and security through our working with our SROs, through the vestibules, the security, the Raptor. We've been doing a lot as far as safety and security, and I want to definitely see that, con that continue and improve. The next I would call intervention. So intervention to me is where do we, where, where is something not going right? And one of those things is in special education, in dyslexia, dysgraphia, in our reading program, those are the things that I really want to focus on uh, going forward in the next four years. We have done things and put those in place for this budget year, and I would really like to see those go to fruition and meeting each student's need where they are. So intervening where they are, that's what I consider an intervention. Whether they are most highly able learner or whether they need a lot of help, we need to meet them where they are so they can find success. And the last thing is the innovation piece. Innovation piece meaning our dual enrollment program, which has been absolutely incredible, taking off thousands of students to help just this semester alone. And we're working toward with the links program, what we're doing um, toward getting students to be able to reach their associate's degree, what we're doing as far as career pathways and our apprenticeships. We're doing some amazing things. Kids have a lot of incredible opportunities, and I like being part of that. I like being able to serve our kids um, in their time. Very good, thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Mr. Rayner, your turn. Thank you. I'll try to speak just as fast. <laughs> Get louder. <laughs> I have three main priorities as well. My first priority is promoting STEAM education in Frederick County. That's not a criticism of the current uh, Board of Education. I think nationally we've had this focus for the last year, since the recession, really, of uh, science, technology, engineering, and math. Well, I think that's valuable and certainly I think we have some very high paying careers. I can tell some of my friends in college now. We, I think we sometimes undervalue and accelerate the value of the social sciences, the fine arts, and humanities playing public education. I want SCPS to be a place where a child, no matter uh, what kind of topics they like to pursue, can be celebrated for their passions, whether that's being the next poet or author or great historian or mathematician. And that's very important to me. Second is equity in school construction and capital improvement around the county. We have, Frederick has a great example, it's a stunning building, it's a real success for the county, it's wonderful to see such a beautiful building. Again, we have a challenge in Frederick County of significant um, overcrowding in the southeastern portion of the Urbana Lake and Monrovia area. And while we're continuing to build new schools, we have a lot of aging schools in the northern and western half of the county, particularly, forgive me, quadrants. And it's challenging to find a way to balance the need for new seats and while renovating older buildings. And it's quite important to make sure we're not forgetting communities around the county, making sure we're spreading the money equitably around Frederick County. And finally is a continuing implementation of the staff uh, salary scale. We have teachers are professionals that deserve to be paid uh, competitively in Frederick County. We're doing a great job. Let's continue that as we head into the future. Thank you. You did well. You did speak as fast. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Young. Thank you. As I said, my, my three top priorities were the salary transition, safety, and the links program. So I'll elaborate on those a little bit more. Uh, a couple of years ago, unfortunately, Frederick County had fallen to the bottom of the starting teacher salary scale in the state of Maryland. And we began to lose teachers to neighboring counties, Washington and Carroll. And while they're both great counties, Frederick County should never lose teachers because of pay to those counties. And so I sat down and the board did with our teachers association and negotiated a new salary scale uh, in order to correct that. Now part of that also meant we had to do a lot of lobbying and working with our county. We've been blessed with our current uh, county executive in funding that pay scale and putting it into place. We have another year to go in that transition. The second is safety. With all the school shootings and things that have gone on through our country, our parents and our students need to feel safe in our buildings. I talk to our law enforcement agencies on a continual basis. We put in place, as Dr. Miller mentioned, the Raptor program where you now have to uh, show your ID coming into the building. We're finishing up the safety festivals as you come into the buildings, but we work very closely with our sheriff and local police departments to make sure that our schools are safe. And finally, the Lynch program here. A building, it's a great new building, but a building is a building. Uh, it's the teachers and the programs that are in the building that make it a success. The Lynch program is intended to make sure that students get the education that they need in the format that they need. I think it's great. I look forward to taking that throughout the rest of our county. Thank you, Ms. Young. Um, so my top three, uh, three priorities all, of course, in a lot of ours do take money, which is why it's really important to vote yes on question one on the ballot on election day. That will keep that money from gambling, um, committed to education and not taken away. So just want to get that word out there. Um, my first one's easy, the, the continued implementation of the salary schedule, because they've already done three out of the four years, so I think that's well on its way to being a, I don't want to say an absolute done deal, it always is there with funding, but uh, it stands a good chance of, of being implemented. But we need to work more to uh, make sure that even trickles down to support staff who often don't make a living wage and um, not as many as we'd like have benefits. Or, so that's, I'd like to keep working on that. Um, career te and technology expansion, center expansion, it's a great opportunity and they turn away too many students, so we need to look at some creative ways, maybe public-private financing, such as they did for the Earth Space Science Lab, um, something creative that where we could expand that. And um, my third has been to make sure that our schools are safe and welcoming, and safe, obviously, is safety. And welcoming is a lot of things. We want to meet students where they're at and make sure that they know they're appreciated for who they are. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Williams. Yes, sir, thank you. Um, so, I think we all have a lot of the same ones. Mine to start out with is salaries, and obviously we need to 
make sure that we are hiring the best and the brightest. And in order to get them here and keep them here, we have to pay them. We are losing them to other places, like a number of other people said, and, and so the salary implementation program that's currently happening right now, that's certainly that in the right direction. Um, the next thing that I wanted to talk about was safety, and I touched on it a little bit before. So we need to be able to work collaboratively, everyone, the mayor, county council, county executive, Dr. Altman, obviously the police department, sheriff's department, into making our buildings safe, because well, whoever wants to uh, think of having their child go to school and not come home, it's happened so many times, and it's devastating every single time. So we need to try to just work together to see what we can do to keep our children safe. It's very critically important. Um, also, and the welcoming part, not just the, the physical part too. When, when kids come to school, we, we want them to come in to be taught. Okay, my last one is diversity. So, I would like to see um, the school system, um, Frederick County Public Schools, at least maybe start to have a council or something to start address, start addressing um, having the schools, uh, maybe leadership, teachers, administrators, be more diverse. Our schools are incredibly diverse. Um, I, my youngest son went to Frederick High School here, um, and it's just, was a beautiful atmosphere. My tour of children with the TJ, same thing. I mean, they they interacted, talked, played, learned with people from every walk of life, and I think that's so wonderful. But I think we need to start incorporating and having more diversity with our teachers and staff, administrators, Indians, Asians, African Americans. Hire the people that look like the students in the school. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mason. If you see my campaign lit, it's on there. Expand, empower, engage. There's a sign out there if you'd like to take one at home and put it in your yard. I appreciate it. Um, expand. Um, just like me, get those kids in honors classes. Challenge them. Challenge our teachers to um, move those kids up that they think they can do it. Uh, I didn't think I could, but if we challenge our kids, most most more times than not, they're gonna they're gonna step up to that challenge and be able to do it. So. Um, we always have to challenge our, our, our students, our parents, our teachers to be able to make sure that we are giving all of our kids the best education. Uh, the CTC program. I'm in real estate. We're always looking for uh, HVAC people, electricians, plumbers. Um, we, we have lots of jobs out there, especially in the construction industry, that are, that are vacant. So if we can get our kids to understand that, you know, being a plumber is fine, but don't just be a plumber. Work towards being the owner of your own plumbing company, uh, not just you know, work for somebody else, but make sure that you are trying to better yourself uh, eventually down the road. Um, I was an athlete, and so when my daughter started playing violin, I started to appreciate the arts and music. Um, so listening to her and her former teacher play uh, violin together, I got a great appreciation for the arts. So um, expanding those opportunities, empower our teachers by giving them a higher salary um, and helping them in the classroom by engaging a community like the Necktie Club, who's in a few of our high schools, who are teaching our kids how to use rough rules of order, which we use on the board. Um, they have leadership roles in the, in the Necktie Club. And the Necktie, is, the Necktie Club is run by a local fraternity. So just making sure that we're engaging our community to get in the school and help us out with our teachers and our students and our administration. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Barrett. Thank you. Um, my three priorities, the first one is, um, it's still why I ran for office in 2014. It is our persistent and pervasive and tremendously unacceptable achievement gaps. Um, in Frederick County, we still see declining achievement, flat achievement for students of color, students who are English language learners, students who receive special education services, and students um, from families uh, who are at or below the poverty line. This remains my priority. I, you know, and it, it sounds silly, but there are nights that I cannot sleep because we are not making the progress that we need to be making. We've had tremendous conversations about what the definition of equity means in Frederick County Public Schools, and those are conversations that we need to continue. My second priority is simply better strategic planning and a focus on continuous improvement. 
as I started to say before I ran out of time in my opening remarks, we have been incredibly lucky. I came on the board at a lucky time, but a very hard time. We were coming out of maintenance of effort funding, and it was absolutely essential that we start to catch up teacher salaries. So, like Mr. Young said, our entire board committed to that work. We increased class size, we made hard decisions. But now that we have more money, it's essential that we start measuring, doing a better job measuring the results of our investments. And my final priority is, of course, to continue the transition to the new teacher salary scale. But I don't think that's enough. We need uh, leadership opportunities for teachers, teachers who can um, move out and uh, develop additional leadership opportunities, have an opportunity not necessarily to move into administration to keep good teachers in the classroom and reward them for staying in the classroom. So those are my three priorities. Thank you. Thank you. We have some really good questions that have come in from the audience, so I'm going to ask everybody to, I kind of zoomed out reading these questions uh, for the candidates to try to stick to their, their 90 seconds, because there's going to be some we maybe aren't going to be able to get to, and, and like I said, there's some really good questions. Uh, the next question, uh, we'll start with Mr. Rayner, we'll kind of, like I said, rotate. And the, uh, the question is, as a candidate for school board, what do you see being the biggest obstacle that FCPS is currently facing? Whoever wrote that, that's a fantastic question. I think it's multifaceted. I would say the current biggest issue we face in Frederick County is continuing to dig out of the hole that the recession left us as a school system and find a way forward as we continue. We've had a wonderful uh, county government continue to give us above maintenance of effort funding and finding a way to restore some of the programs and activities and um, sacrifices that were made during the recent recession and how we move forward as a school system. Again, and more broadly, I'd also say that finding and ensuring we continue, it touches on things um, Dr. Miller and Ms. Barrett have both said, equal access and equal opportunity for all students with SCPS. Your zip code should not determine your GPA in Frederick County you should be able to attend a magnet program with CTC, regardless of where you live in Frederick County. Of course, it comes back to a funding issue, but again, making sure every, every student in Frederick County has that opportunity, it leads to a, um, a more successful and more shared success for all of us who live here. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Young. I'm going to agree that funding obviously always is a major obstacle and always will be, and certainly, uh, the more funding you have, the more things that you can do. Uh, I'm going to say that I, I think in my eight years on the board, the one thing that I realize is that every problem that our school system has is a community problem. When we're looking at the opioid addiction problem, we're looking at suicide rate, we're looking at boy ex bullying ex exclusion, and many other things. Most of these things start in the community and work their ways into the schools. One of the big things that I've had a big focus on the last five years is adding additional mental health positions there at schools, additional social workers and clinical psychologists that can help work with young students that have issues that they are getting met in the home place. Uh, having now, I have two grandchildren, my oldest grandson is uh, just about to turn three, and it scares the you know what out of me when young kids start to get on social media. There's so many bad things that happen there that then roll over into our school system and as parents and as a community. Again, why I'm staying involved at this point is because I have a deep commitment to young people. I think it's great having a young person like Camden that's stepping forward to run because we need younger ideas, we need different ideas. But as a community, we need to work together to solve these issues that are facing our community and I think we can get those done. And that's why I'm running again. Sitting here racking my brain thinking biggest obstacle and I'm afraid it always comes back to money because every obstacle I think could be helpfully addressed with more money. Um, several years ago with the recession every single school had to cut one teaching position. We haven't been able to come back from that. Um, we implemented three of the four years of the salary schedule hopefully addressing class size, and they're trying to do it in revenue-neutral ways. Um, right now, um, 
Media specialists that are in smaller schools might have to go to a large school once a week to help out, to try to cover things. So they're trying to find revenue neutral ways, but money would obviously help us get class size down. Um, more psychologists and more support staff for the um, students, money. Um, eliminating the achievement gap. You know, studies show repeatedly, the Kerwin Commission currently, Ronald Reagan is a nation at risk, that there's a certain level of funding that has to come to support the public schools in the way it needs to be supported. So um, I think to me that's the biggest obstacle and we're going to start to address all the individual obstacles. Thank you. Ms. Williams. Thank you very much. Yes, I, you know, I have to agree with each person that has gone before me and I would have to say that Funding is always going to be the number one issue because without the appropriate funding, people fighting for this money and not just, you know, our, our, our local government here, county council, the mayor, the aldermen, you know, everybody that's involved in getting these funds past through Annapolis, it's, it's critically important that we have the right people in place fighting for the funding so the programs could exist. And that's, that's pretty much all I have to say. It's just, if we have the money to do it, it's just like in your own personal life. If you have money to do something, you have more opportunities to do it. We, we could reach more people. The teachers could teach each child. We never know what teacher is going to reach what child. Um, we just need to have the funds. That's what it all boils down to. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mason. The achievement gap. When I uh, finished my master's up in 2012, I joined a local community group called Eliminate Achievement Gaps. And when the stats are broken down, um, our African American students are at the bottom, still remain there. We started with Park in 2014, and the gap got bigger. I think we need more minority teachers in the classroom, that would help. We need more mentors in the schools, that would help. I think we need to focus on those kids that are at the bottom, challenge them, like I said before. Get them to take those honors classes. Once they figure out they can do it, they will do it. That will solve some of the achievement gap problems. Solve some of the issues that we have with our kids being bored in school and causing problems for our teachers. I think once we focus on the achievement gap, seriously, I think we will solve a lot of problems. Thank you, Ms. Barrett. My answer is a little different. Obviously, the money is a huge issue. And like I said, when I joined the board in 2014, we were coming out of it and we've pushed hard, but at some point, whoever is elected to be our county executive also has to prioritize our fire service, other public services in Frederick County. We have a $615 million budget. I am a progressive person, but I'm also fiscally conservative, and I think you need to be in Frederick County. Our biggest obstacle in Frederick County Public Schools is a little bit of risk aversion. It's fear of boldness, it's fear of risk, it's fear of doing something different. And I don't say that lately. I've been sitting on the board four years, and I have been, I've started my career in federal government with OMB report cards and constant performance monitoring. And then I moved to the business sector where we had to, I had to share a hotel room on traveling to save money. There are hard decisions that need to be made. But at the end of the day, public education is about educators, teachers, and staff connecting with students, having more opportunities for that. So that means saying no to state and federal mandates, pushing the envelope so teachers can teach. When I talk about boldness and excellence, every single person who goes into public education wants to be the, the owner of their classroom. They want to lead and they want to innovate and we have to give them an opportunity to do that. I don't need, I don't want a Frederick Cruz article, or Frederick Cruz Post article about Liz jeopardizing our state and federal funding, but we have to start pushing back sometimes. We must, we have to own it and have that local control and that means down to the classroom level. Thank you. Dr. Miller. Thank you. My, also, my answer is also gonna be a little bit different. Um, it's, it's interesting, uh, since I've been on the board, our funding has gone up about $96 million. 
When I got on the board eight years ago, it was only our budget was a little bit over $500 million, and now our last budget was over $600. So funding has been there, especially in the last four years. The, during the recession, it was difficult. We had to make difficult choices. One of the choices that I did not make was to increase, increase class size because I did not think that was the right decision, especially because it did go to fund salary increases. So the, if you say you want one and not the other, there, is, there are limits, and there are, there are limits to, to funding, and, and that's just how it works. You have to live within that and you have to prioritize. And for me, the priority is reaching each and every student. That is what the biggest obstacle in Frederick County is because it, it call, comes down to how do we reach each and every student? How do we support that teacher to reach that student's needs? How do we support that special education student? How do we support that highly able learner? Every student is unique and has different learning styles. It, they have different things that they're bringing to school in their backpack. And that backpack is very different than when I went to school, what's coming to school. The anxiety, the behaviors, the mental health, all of these things are packed in that backpack. And then they're broadcast, like Brad was saying, on social media. So the things that these children are dealing with, the things that our teachers are dealing with, are very, very different. But we have to focus on how to reach each and every. And that will solve a lot of the issues that we have. Thank you. You all did well. Um, to change things up a little bit, we often hear complaints or concerns. This next question, and we'll start with Mr. Young on this one, Tell us one or two things about FCPS school system that you love and would not want to change. That's easy. The first one is our outstanding teachers and staff. I, I spend a lot of time in our schools and going throughout uh, our county. And again, we are very blessed that we have many dedicated and committed uh, teachers, cafeteria workers, bus drivers, front office support folks, and central office folks that deeply care about their students and what goes on. So I do take it personal when I hear people bash from the county public schools because we have people that pour their hearts and souls into what they're doing. So I think our number one asset is our employees uh, that we have here in Frederick County. Again, I take great pride in our CTC center. My oldest daughter, when she was in the 10th grade, struggled in school. I took her to the CTC open house she took up a love for nursing. Since that time, she's completed her associate's degree, her bachelor's degree, her master's degree. Now she's the charge nurse at Frederick Memorial Hospital Emergency Room, and now she's teaching uh, at Frederick Community College. And so that passion uh, for education came through to her, but came through our career in technology center. So the opportunities uh, that our students have in Frederick County Public Schools uh, always make me be with her. We had another young lady uh, out there at the CTC that designed the emblem that's going to go on the Barack Obama Presidential Library. She was selected, her design was selected from ones throughout the country, and that happened right here in Frederick County. Thank you. Ms. Young. Well, I was a teacher for 25 years. I worked with phenomenal people. Um, in the wider public, you frequently hear criticisms of teachers, and I just didn't work with those people. Support staff, um, hardworking administrators, central office, um, just wonderful, wonderful people. So I think uh, people feel a pride in Frederick County Schools and, and like to work here and like to keep that going. The other thing I think we have in Frederick County Schools, of course, the CTC, but the Earth Space Science Lab for elementary students is such a gem. And it, even when it was in uh, uh, South Frederick or Lincoln, um, Mr. Grills and Mr. Bowman made it wonderful. And now that they have the new facility, it's not even that new anymore. But it's just such a gem. If you haven't had an opportunity um, to visit there, you know, got to go there every year with students, and I've taken my grandchildren. It's a wonderful place, and I think it's uh, just something great that we have. Thank you, Ms. Williams. Yes, sir. Thank you. So, um, um, the staff, teachers, administrators, employees, they are the backbone to having our children learn. We want to make sure that we have these right people in place. And I know I've spent so many years in the schools, um, uh, 
just seeing and being with everybody. I, I would come in on a Friday, I was off spending the entire day. I'd be in PE, I'd be on the playground, I'd be in math, I'd be cutting paper in the office. So many wonderful people, cafeteria workers, people who take out the trash. I mean, it, it takes, you hear that, it takes a village. It really does. These folks are so committed to our students, and it was great to be a part of that for over 30 years. I mean, it, it was just was wonderful. The other thing is funding, having the funding uh, for these programs, because you never know what program a child is going to take that's going to be the light for them. I have three children, and they're all different. My oldest son was an outstanding athlete here in Frederick County. He went to school on a full athletic scholarship. He has three degrees, and he's a year from getting his PhD. My middle son is just a child of the world, not an athlete. He likes to write, he likes to read comic books, he likes to play video games. He's just himself, a beautiful person. Also, my youngest son, music and arts. He was an athlete as well, but he loved music. He was in the marching band. I wouldn't have ever really thought that, but that was his thing, so we went with that. He's also an Eagle Scout, so you never know when you have the funding for these programs, what is going to really attract these kids? And everybody deserves a chance to just be who they are. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mason. The expansive opportunities we have for our kids to shine. Um, I mean, the Frederick Burger Club, and we have lunch every Wednesday. 10 months out of the year, we bring it to high schools with uh, either a principal, an AD, a guidance counselor, somebody, and two students from each high school who are nominated by the principal to come to our library for four weeks. They get to, uh, at the end of the four weeks, tell them what they've experienced over those four weeks. Um, but the first week, one of our Rotarians gets to read their, their kind of resume and what they do. And some of these kids are so bright, so amazing. They have uh, great opportunities past high school to go to great colleges. They come in with 4.7 weighted GPAs. We had a kid that had going into college 22 credits because of the um, uh, because of being able to go to FCC while she's uh, in high school. We have incredible opportunities. We have a great music program, a great engineering program. We have an IB program at Urbana. I think there's so many different things that we offer our kids to do. We have the CTC program. Kids can come out with a certificate. Instead of going into college, they can go into an apprenticeship, work for two years, and come out making just as much money as uh, probably some of us. Um, so we just have so many opportunities for kids to, to be able to find what their passion is, learn it, live it, and go on beyond high school and become great Frederick citizens. And we always encourage kids, once they go out, go to college or wherever, to come join our library to become, become a great citizen of Frederick County. Thank you, Ms. Barrett. Well, they seem to have taken all the good answers. <laughs> No, I, I, I've had some, some moments to think there. Um, the, the, so I grew up in Marysville, and I thought Frederick was just too small. So I went to Northeastern Pennsylvania for college, and um, went to University of Maryland for my uh, graduate work, and I went to law school in Washington, D.C. And along the way, I lived in the D.C. area, I lived in downtown Baltimore, and just thought the city was for me. And I needed to live in the city, and then um, it was time to have a baby. And I was like, how do you even go upstairs with groceries when you're pregnant? So I said, Frederick County is where I want to come back to. And this is where I want to put my kids in our schools. And when I got back here, I was so happy that I did because Frederick County has changed for the better. So to get to the answer, what I value most is the diversity of Frederick County and the diversity in our public schools. Um, there, there are probably uh, at least 60 I think it's 60 languages spoken in this high school alone. It is tremendous. Um, and these are opportunities for our kids. We, we have farmland around us, we have beautiful Frederick City, and our kids are getting experiences um, by being with their classmates that are part of their education. And that last piece is we still are Frederick County. There are kindness and connection. I have had kindnesses done to my children in Frederick County Public Schools by other adults that have just been so touching to me. Um, I've had teachers deliver work to my house. I've had bus drivers um, with just the words that my kids needed to hear that day. So even as we grow and we change, um, 
the kindness of our people and the commitment to always getting it done and doing their very best um, just uh, just make us an excellent school system. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Miller. This job has it come, doesn't come with too many benefits, but one of the, really, one of the most fabulous things is graduation. And we try to go to as many of them as we can. We have a whole week that we usually set aside and we take time and we go to graduations. And you sit there and I still get chills, chills every time I hear pump. It just, right down my back. You sit in there and it, we are surrounded by communities and the community and you can feel the energy and the passion and the support for those students. And that's the best thing about Frederick County is because we have that everywhere. And so they're surrounded by teachers that have supported them. And FCPS teachers changed my life and they changed the life every single, lives every single day in those classrooms. Our support employees, they are incredibly passionate about what they do and how they serve our kids. So it, it goes from, from top to bottom, our, our staff, our community, and our community partnerships. We're very lucky. One of the first things I did when we got on the board is because we were kind of a little silo with Frederick County, but we're all Frederick County, and we're all one Frederick County. And so we did a synergies committee, and we pulled in the county, we pulled in FCC, we pulled in the municipalities, and we started saying, how can we save money? How can we work together? How can we partner? And that mentality has stayed, and it's just the way we do business in Frederick County now. Working with FCC, there's not any other county in the state of Maryland that works as well as we do with our community college. And those are things that give us our opportunities for our students. They give us our business partnerships, and they let our students have the incredible opportunities being surrounded by the community and the teachers that support them. And that's what I think is amazing about FCPS. Thank you. Mr. Rayner. Thank you. It's wonderful to have some time to think here. I, on a more serious note, again, I would say, I can't emphasize this, we've all said it eloquently up here, the commitment of our educators, and a special shout out to our, our special education instructional assistants and people who, who work so closely with children. I come from a special needs family. I'm familiar with the, with the real love our employees have for our students, and our students need that. And I, I say that personally as a thank you to SCPS as well for all they've done for my family and for families all around Frederick County. It is truly an invaluable service they provide to our students. Uh, and I, I really do mean that sincerely. Additionally, um, something that's affected me personally, I love the opportunities we have, especially for our high schools, high school seniors and juniors, and career advancement. Uh, Jay mentioned earlier AP credits going into I have 31 AP credits going into college. I skipped a year of college. That saved me, I mean, goodness, 50, 20, $25,000. This matters to students, and it's incredible in the era of really accelerating college costs and the pressure to find a job is so acute. We have a wonderful, dual enrollment program here in Frederick County. I love seeing um, students who are graduating with um, associate's degrees and um, apprenticeships. I mean, goodness, I pay more tuition than anything. I don't know how my car works. <laughs> it, it's really, we are teaching students skills, and that's what I think we're here in public education to do, marketable skills, and how to be a good citizen as well, and that comes back to the love they have for our students. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, you guys are creeping over that 90 seconds a little bit. Got to tighten it up a little. Um, Ms. Yoder, we will start with you. The question is, what do you see as the school system's role in addressing the needs of the whole child, specifically support positive mental wellness and early intervention supports? I can't hate to keep harping on this, but as a 25-year teacher, you know, but as a teacher, I know if the students aren't coming to school with their head in the game, you're not teaching them that day. If they haven't had breakfast, if they've had a fight with a parent, um, dad didn't come home for some reason, you're not teaching them that day. Um, one student can totally disrupt an entire classroom. So it's really important that we help these students uh, cope with the trauma that they're experiencing. Um, I'm thinking of a particular student from last year right now who comes to my mind, and as soon as the campaign's over, I've talked to his teacher already. I want to go home, go into school and help her help him this year because we didn't get it done last year, and, and this child's either going to um, have a lot of potential or he's going to bottom out, and I'd like to help her make sure that he does the former. Um, uh, trying to think, you know, think of all the students through the years. Um, 
The other thing I started seeing, it's a, it's a flip side of that, is that we need to teach students to be resilient. I started having students come up to me with minor complaints that were causing them to fall apart. So help them be resilient, but help them get help when they truly need it. And my time is up. Thank you, Ms. Williams. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, again, I, I agree with Karen. I, I, I think we have to get them here first. And so, um, you know, once they walk through our doors, be that um, arms wrapped around them in the form of teachers, uh, administrators, anyone that they may run into in the course of the day, uh, the village per se, community, parents, FCPS working together um, to teach, but we have to initially get them here. And, and once they get here, then we can do a good job. So that's pretty much it. Thank you. Mr. Mason. Sure. I just have to find it first. <laughs> no, we're good. Um, what do you see as the school system's role in addressing the needs of the whole child, specifically to support positive mental wellness and early intervention supports? You have to get to know the child, the family, the dynamic, what the uh, child is going through. Um, on the board of SHIP a few years ago, the Student Homelessness Initiative Partnership, and you have to understand what's going on at home first before you can try to teach a child. Um, there's so many challenges that many of our students have. If you are familiar with the ALICE report that just came out, 40% of our students are living at the poverty level or below. So there's a lot of our community members that have several issues going on in their lives and can't afford to put food on the table or can't afford gas in the car. So, you know, that causes problems at home. They're, they're not working at a, at a, a high paying high -pay job that they can support their family. So that causes the students to have issues. And if we try to just teach the, teach the kid when they come to school without understanding what's going on at home, we're not going to be able to reach it. We have to try to get to know our parents. Teachers have to, it would be nice if we could go back to home visits and have our, have our parents get to know families. So they can just, just understand what's going on. The dynamic for so many families in our community is, is, is troubling. And it, it's hard for kids to learn once they come to school if they have so many other things to think about. So we just have to make sure that you know, we're trying to teach them the executive functions, how to deal with conflicts, so that they're not lashing out at their students, or at their, their uh, classmates, or teachers, or their student uh, resource officers, or our, our support staff. You know, we just, we just have to make sure that we're trying to understand the whole family dynamic. Thank you, Ms. Barrett. I think, I think my colleagues up here have expressed um, what, I, what I know is shared concern about our kids and the challenges that face them in Frederick County. As board members, as elected officials, there are very specific things we can do, and there are both um, policy um, solutions, um, their funding solutions, their uh, priorities, prioritization of resources. Um, I know our teachers every day are caring about those concerns of home, the trauma, um, the family concerns, the poverty. Um, when I first joined the board, um, the well-being of our kids, their mental health status, the increasing anxiety was a tremendous concern. So in a very difficult budget year, I pushed hard and advocated um, for licensed clinical social workers, which I think are a very effective and agile solution. Um, more licensed clinical social workers um, cost a little bit less than school psychologists and they focus on um, not only the child but connections with the family. So um, I, as, as, as we look to use our budget more effectively, I think more licensed clinical social workers are a tremendous solution and it can't be pulled out to do testing with kids like psychologists can. When I say testing, I mean standardized testing. Um, I also think the idea of community schools, we have one, um, we have basically that model um, at Hillcrest and also I think at Butterfly Ridge, it's coming along where we have on-site medical, we have um, mental health care for families, we have English language learning training, we have a tremendous amount of family resources. If we're going to spend 114 to 120 million dollars to build this high school, this school needs to be a place where everybody can access resources. It is an investment we have made, and we need to get every penny out of this building in terms of serving our kids and the whole child. Thank you.
Thank you. Dr. Miller. Um, one of the things that we do partner well with is the Child Find and our Judy Center, where we, we are reaching kids very, very early, and those programs are incredible. And then to piggyback on something that Liz said, because then they feed into a, um, a model where you would have a licensed clinical social worker that's for the feeder pattern. And that's very important. We started it at Brunswick and Catoctin. And what that licensed clinical social worker does, that not only do they work with the students in the high school, but then also the middle school and the elementary school, because guess what? They're families. So a lot of times what's going on with the family is the same family at the elementary and the high school level. So just having that from child find from when those children are born, what that family is going through, what they're going through in that community, and that longitudinal path all the way up through high school of how we can support or how we know that family and keeping that position stable and not having it be subject to budget years and, and loss of position, having that same person as much as we can in those communities and building that community trust is critical as far as I think. Um, the other thing is, um, is we have done a lot of study on ACEs and adverse childhood experiences and we're trying to educate um, our staff and our teachers on what that looks like and how we support, what some of these traumas, because we do have kids that have gone through a lot of trauma and a lot in their short lives and how does that impact their classroom and what can we do about it as a school system as they're coming through the door. The other thing we need to do is have more behavioral support when there is a disruption in the classroom. We need school um, people in the school to support those students um, and then we also need to figure out again back to each and every what is preventing that child from learning on that day. Thank you. Mr. Rayner. Thank you. I, I really appreciate us having this conversation at all. Again, as the most recent candidate to have gone through middle and high school, I mean, it's not always a fun time, and we have students, could be in the age of social media, as Brad mentioned earlier, especially nasty comments. I don't believe we're all fundamentally mean people. I think it comes out more on social media and the internet, and it certainly is not fun to grow up with in this age when everything is public and your mistakes, and how you, it's how I've grown up, to be frank with you, and it's, it's not always fun. I mean, to me, I can speak personally, um, Liz mentioned social workers and a psychologist. We need to continue to work to lower the ratio of students to school psychologists and guidance counselors. I was really blessed. I had the same guidance counselor from 6th to 12th grade, and that longitudinal relationship, it is incredible to have the same person to talk to over such a length of time and to really get to know to know a staff member and to understand you are you are welcomed and you are heard and you are affirmed in who you are throughout our school system. So again, Continue to make sure, um, as Karen mentioned earlier, the affirmation of students in a particularly difficult time to be a teenager in our school system uh, through social media and that means. Thank you. Mr. Young. Thank you. A lot of the things that were said there are extremely important. Pre-K is certainly also a great uh, start for our students. Having our students be at a level when they show up for kindergarten to be ready to learn and move forward and providing their supports are very important. Child Find, Judy Center, uh, SHIP, as was uh, mentioned by Mr. Mason, Mason, outstanding program, blessings in the backpack, making sure our students show up uh, that are fed the night before or over the weekend. We have many great organizations in our community that are helping out, like the Asian Center out around 40, with after school tutoring and mentoring the parents uh, and helping them find ways to make sure their students stay engaged. We recently, as a board, uh, came up with a partnership with the Boys and Girls Club. They'll be moving into where the new success program is down on Washington Street. Again, the Boys and Girls Club doing great things to keep these young folks engaged in their education. The mental health pieces are extremely important. Again, uh, students, when they're not focused on what is important during their educational day, are not going to be as successful. So, we need to make sure that if there are issues that are there, that we have the supports available to them. As Dr. Miller mentioned, the medical services, again, uh, that's extremely important as well. So, again, these are all community problems. We have to work together with all the agencies throughout the county, the community service organizations, and within our budget to make sure our students have the resources that they need. Thank you. Next question. I'm swimming in questions up here, so I'll apologize in advance to some of you that don't get your questions asked, but I'll try to combine a few of them. Uh, we'll start with Ms. Williams this time. Uh, part of what was discussed was one of the assets of the school system, of course, the employees and the teachers in particular. This question says, what are your plans to attract and retain great teachers? Well, obviously, um, pay. Is, is certainly one thing that will 
get them here and keep them here. But uh, again, um, Frederick County, uh, the city has a lot to offer. I mean, people want to come and they want to live and you know, they want to have it nice for their families. They want to live in a nice place, have their kids grow up in a, in a good place where there's good education system, obviously, in Frederick County Public Schools. So um, that, that would be one of the things that I would certainly think as a whole, just having everything here. You know, we want them to live and work and play here. So is there a second part? No, just that part. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Mason, I got the question if you want me to repeat it. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, my, one of my top priorities is to expand our, our diversity in our teaching staff and to let those teachers know that Frederick County is a great place to live. I grew up in Lewistown, which is very close to Rocky Ridge. So when I was growing up, there was a lot of uh, talk of KKK, um, and that was kind of in my backyard. So for me to help teachers come here, understand that that element's going to be wherever you go, but I have not had any problems with it. And we just need to understand that Frederick is a great place to live. There's a lot that Frederick has to offer. We have a great art scene, a great music scene. Um, in the summer, you go to Baker Park. And you, you see so many families out there uh, on Sunday nights enjoying Frederick County. Um, we have arts festivals. We have uh, great colleges here. It's an awesome place to live. It's a great place to raise a family. Like I said, I have three kids. So it's just making sure that those old, those very old um, uh, misnomers about Frederick are gone. Um, some people outside of Frederick like to say that that's a problem. That's not our problem. We can attract great teachers here, and we can retain them. Thank you, Ms. Barrett. Well, this is one of my my favorite topics. Um, so, I mean, we need to modernize our HR practices. I don't know why public education, and it seems like we're not the only county, seems to have um, HR practices that are um, significantly behind uh, business and private industry. And I know there's well, laws and regulations, but we've got to do better. So yes, there is a nationwide teaching shortage. So there, there are fewer applicants. Um, we absolutely need to be hiring for quality. Um, one, one of the big problems that I hear all the time is that you know, in Frederick County, unlike Montgomery County, because they're significantly larger, or Howard County, um, we absolutely can't even like really get moving on an aggressive part of the recruiting process until positions open. So that, that can't be our answer anymore because we're losing candidates. So we need a better solution. We need to say, as a board, that's not okay. So we need something different. We are doing a good job in Frederick County of starting to grow our own teachers. And we absolutely must continue this. So um, kids in high school um, who show uh, are interested in, in education, um, our, teacher, our Frederick County Teacher Academy is one place, and our Career Technology Center is another place where they can work on some of those skills. I believe strongly in incentives, like private industry incentives, like student loan repayment, let's talk about it. Um, let's talk about things that are best practices in the private industry. Um, let's talk about gym memberships. Let's, let's really think about this. What makes you want to come teach in Frederick County? Let's pretend we're not in 1964 with our hiring practices and our recruitment, because as Mr. Rayner so happily pointed out, you know, we have a completely different generation of kids here. Um, who want different for their careers. And my final point is one that I made before. Teaching in itself is a, is a profession. We do not hire teachers because we want to make principals. We hire teachers because they are committed to teaching in kids. The only way to make more money in public education is to become a principal, and that is unfortunate. So we have to create leadership opportunities for teachers who become masters of their craft, and they can be rewarded accordingly for becoming masters of their craft rather than thinking they have to become a principal. That's all. Dr. Miller. Ditto. No. Well, yes, but um, that's not what I'm going to say. Um, absolutely to the timing and the modernization of HR um, and the incentives to teach, to keep our teachers in the classroom. We have some incredible teachers, and yes, the tendency is to pull them up, pull them out, so we do need to give them those leadership opportunities so they can stay in contact with students. Um, the, also, the strengths of Frederick County and living here and how diverse our community has become um, and how passionate we are about our public education is a huge um, attraction for, 
for teachers to want to come here. Um, equalizing our, our salary scale across, uh, making sure it's attractive as far as on that lower end of the scale for um, teachers to want to come to Frederick County, to even look to come here, and training up our own. With, um, I have recently had uh, someone told me they, they started as an IA in another county, and I, I asked them, I said, well, check into their, um, their continuing education policy and their education reimbursement, because what we've done here is a lot of our IAs that want to become teachers, we actually do a lot of um, help and support for them if they do then want to become teachers to reimburse them um, as far as their tuition reimbursement. And then um, also we are working on a teacher apprenticeship program to get students who are interested in apprenticing as teachers to kind of grow our own teachers because again, we have so many families where education runs through the family. Their, their parents were teachers, their grandparents were teachers. It's really awesome to see and we need to keep them here in Frederick County and then as well as a partnership where we do maybe do some tuition reimbursement if you're going to stay in Frederick County for a certain amount of time and we work on getting them their AA degree through the teaching academy uh, by their senior year and then get their bachelor's and even possibly their master's by the time they get up here. Mr. Ray. <laughs> Thank you for that smooth transition. Um, <laughs> oh, we're all aware, as Ms. Barrett mentioned, there is a nationwide teaching shortage. Last week, we reported we had the lowest unemployment rate since 1969. It's an incredibly tight job market out there. And again, I struggle, I say this all the time, if you're a young college graduate with significant amounts of student debt, you're going to go to the place that's going to pay you the most, first and foremost. I don't think that's unreasonable to assume from a young college graduate. That being said, money isn't everything, and I, I think it'd be a mistake to assume it is. We want, I think we want our staff to be able to afford to live and work in Frederick County. It's a wonderful kind of living. We have some beautiful communities all around. And again, I want to go back to the homegrown teacher aspect. I'm the son of two homegrown teachers here in Frederick County. If there's nothing more satisfying as my parents tell me, to teach where you grew up and to be able to go back to where you started and get back to the community to help make you. That being said, my graduating class of 271 students, I believe we had four or five teachers. It's not, we're getting there, but I'd love to see more, more of our FCPS graduates really embrace uh, teaching as a viable career. You're not going to become a millionaire in public education. It is a public service, but I think through our uh, salary scale transition, it's, we can show it's a service that we value. And I think that's incredibly important as we head up as we go forward. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Young. I want to echo that the, the pay is extremely important. I think we've done a lot, as I've already talked about, to address that. The second thing is we have to make sure that our teachers uh, know that they're appreciated. I go out of my way constantly to do little things, uh, dropping cookies off at schools, writing notes to teachers. I know emails are great, but there's nothing like a handwritten note to tell somebody thank you for what you're doing. Uh, in our county, we offer tuition reimbursement for our teachers. We offer it at the Hood College rate, which is a higher rate, so most of our teachers can finish their, back, their master's degree uh, and have it paid for. Uh, we have a great benefit package, health insurance, uh, uh, and other, uh, other benefits here in front of the county, so we have to emphasize those things, quality of life. Again, I think there's no better place in Maryland to live than right here in Frederick County, and we need to make a, do a better job of emphasizing that. As was said, I think we can work with some of our support employees to help them transition to be teachers. There's no one that I'm probably more proud of than Ronnie Veer, who's been an instructional assistant in one of our schools, and he's worked towards transitioning to be a teacher. One of the obstacles that he faced was he said, Brad, you know, you don't pay tuition reimbursement, but I need time off to do my classroom teaching. And one of the things we worked is working with the sabbatical and changing the sabbatical to help him with that. So we need to listen and help grow our own teachers, but we have a lot of great people within our system that I think we can make any great teachers. Thank you. Ms. Yellow. Going down my list of things I wrote, and I'm thinking everybody got things. Salary brings teachers here, maybe. Um, a lot of, I've been surprised and pleased at how many of my um, children's friends came back to teach, not only in Frederick County, but the schools that they actually went to. Um, so, you know, we have to let them know that Frederick County is a great place. But Frederick County also has to have um, affordable housing. I know that the county is working on things with Livable Frederick. That's really important because if you get them here with salary and it seems like a great place, how do you keep them here? Um, so that's an important thing. Also, I think we can sometimes get people here from other places if they have a support system. So a lot of times when you come to a school, you get a mentor teacher, and the county does a lot of things for new teachers. 
that maybe ought to extend into the community so the teachers know they have somebody they can fall back on if they're they just need to know where to get their car fixed or what bank to use or whatever. Um, with the teacher's opportunities, it's not even just advancement, that can be important, but I, a teacher I know taught 30 years from 22 to 52, she would have stayed in it, but there was nowhere for her to go except the classroom. The intervention positions could be moved around, not just gotten by one person and held for 20 years or whatever, or seen as a stepping stone, but let's switch them around for um, different staff members. Um, and student loan forgiveness, I think, would be something where then you commit to teaching here. Sorry for going long. That's okay. We're, we're back to the next question. Okay, we're going to tighten things up a little more. I'm not going to, like, jump up and down, but when that card goes up, I'm going to ask you to, to finish your thought, because we still have a lot of questions, and I'd like to get as many of them as we could. Um, we're back up here with Mr. Mason, the first question. How do you differentiate the role of a Board of Education member as opposed to staff and high-level administrators? Administrators. Well, the role of the Board is to set policy and regulations. Um, I think it's essential to work with the administration and, and all staff. Um, I'm on a few boards, so I think the best way to get somebody to to, to achieve their goals, to um, be the best possible employee that we can ask for, is, is to talk to them, to listen to them, to not always tell them what they need to do. It's uh, it, it goes both ways. I, I want to make sure that our staff is is being is able to express, be open with how they feel. Uh, I don't want to be a board member that just sits there and you know. I, I'm not going to listen to whatever you say. I don't want to hear what you have to say. I want to be open. I'm uh, dealing with my daughter going into that, that math class. There was, there was, I didn't feel like there was an open dialogue. I, I don't think anybody's more important than anybody else. I think we work to, we have to work well together. And we have to be a great school system. The only way to do that is, is to make sure that we're, we're listening to each other and working well together. Thank you, Ms. Barrett. Well, the, the two roles of Board of Education members are to set the policy for Frederick County Public Schools and to um, establish the budget and um, define the budget priorities. Um, along the way, um, we have a strategic plan for Frederick County Public Schools that was um, being finalized when I joined the board. We absolutely, as a board, need to do a better job of measuring the results of our investments <clears throat> Excuse me, against that strategic plan. So I would add that to that policy and budget piece. Um, additionally, uh, you know, as Mr. as Mr. Mason said, as a board member, um, you know, we have a, a zillion constituents. Um, Frederick County is a big place. We've got 43,000 kids in our schools. They all have families, parents and grandparents who love and care for them. We have um, a tremendous amount of community partners in Frederick County Public Schools. And um, I take a lot of pride in the fact that I've, in the last four years, I've met individually um, for coffee or by telephone or for pancakes even with over 200 community members. I have um, several spiral bound notebooks where I've kept notes and those conversations are absolutely crucial to me. The ones I have at the bus stop with my neighbors, um, the, the messages I get from community members saying, hey, is this an issue? Um, I don't see the white flag yet, I see it now. But the last thing I want to say is the board member is um, I have prioritized the position of ombuds, the ombuds person in the school system, because it's a place to confidentially share issues or concerns. We'll have to go ahead and cut you off. Okay. <laughs> Good try, okay. <laughs> Dr. Miller uh, might be next. Go ahead. I'll finish that. The ombudsman is a critical role that we put as to be a liaison between the board and the school system and um, for the, um, the community. It's a place for the community to bring to concerns for it to be confidential um, and to help facilitate that communication. And it is a critical role right now, and especially to help us as board members, because it's hard. It, that is one of the hardest things to do is to keep yourself at this level up here where you're supposed to be deciding on the policy. But then you're impacted by how that policy is implemented. I'm impacted every day by the policies that we set and the decisions that we make in the budget with the Board of Ed when we cut, when ninth grade sports was cut. I'm impacted by these decisions every single day because of my students and my kids. And I hear it on the playgrounds, I hear it on the soccer courts, I hear it on the volleyball court, I hear it everywhere. As a board member, I never turn this off. It is 24-7 for me. This, I love this. It's, 
my office, I'm an optometrist, I listen to the families, I listen to the concerns, and I talk to the students. So if that part of it's 24-7. But we as board members, we only direct one person, and that is the superintendent. We don't direct any other staff, so there is a clear level and a clear line of differentiation. And as a board member, we have to facilitate that relationship. We also, me as an individual member, I can do nothing by myself. I have to have four votes to do anything, any action. So this, the partnership of working with the board and how we communicate with each other and how we get done is a critical piece and critically important. But we are all FCPS. Mr. <laughs> Mr. Ainer. The question regarding the difference between board and administrators, is that correct? Exactly, uh, roles between the two. Thank you. Well, I'd say first, the role of the administrator in FCPS is to essentially, in most cases, execute and administer the role of the board of education, thereby the superintendent. The role of board of education members and that is to be a conduit to the public or responsible to the general public in that case. Uh, I think an important aspect of the members were above the, we all have our, I don't know, our high school that we went to, our familial ties. We do what's in the best interest of the public and the school system at large. And that's quite important to remember. Again, the reason we have board education, we're seven people out of roughly a quarter million here in Frederick County that will make decisions. It's incredibly important. You know, I don't think any of us, uh, we're all obviously passionate, but again, anybody, this is meant to be a community, a civic service, a public service to the community here in Frederick County. And I, I think that addresses the difference there. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Young. To put it very simple, the board oversees the school system, the administrators run it. Uh, as was said, we're responsible for setting policy, we're responsible for setting the budget, and the third important one is we're responsible for hiring and monitoring our CEO, uh, which is Superintendent Dr. Aubin. Beyond that, then the board members are always I see is to be the eyes and the ears in the community as to what's going on, what's working well, what's not, listening to feedback. Mr. Hand and the audience has come to many, many board meetings uh, to advocate for additional dyslexia needs in our school system. As a board, we listen to that. That's important. Every board member meeting, we have public comment. But between board meetings, I get people that run into you in the store, that will send you an email. And if there's an idea or something that they have, it's my job to bring it back. Uh, it's not my job to tell staff to do this or to do that. As a board, we discuss uh, what policies we want, how we want things to uh, be implemented. Uh, it comes down to what the staff does. And so again, a board member is a conduit between the public and the staff that's there. But our job is to make sure that they're going in the direction of doing the right things for our students and to let them do their work on a day-to-day -day basis. Ms. Young. Sorry. There we go. Um, I'm thinking back to being in a classroom, and the average teacher on a daily basis doesn't think much about what the school, um, the Board of Education has done. It's not on their minds all the time, until they make a decision that the teachers don't particularly like, or they increase their salary. But on a day-to-day -day basis, there's definitely that buffer that is um, the administration. Um, I think Mr. Um, Young put it very nicely, uh, the way he said, you know, the, the school board supports and the administrators run, um, and, and the kind of liaison there for the school is the administration between the decisions of the Board of Ed. I think it's really important to listen to the community. Um, I know I've gone and spoken to the Board of Ed on many occasions, and, and you see when the students come in and ask for their programs, can be very persuasive. Then the Board of Ed has to take all of that into account and make the tough decisions, and we know they've made some very tough decisions. Um, so that's what I see the role as, and not to, uh, not to supersede, not to overstep your bounds, not to go in and run the schools. Thank you. Ms. Williams. Yes, sir, thank you. So I'll get to be the last one on this one. But uh, again, all the sentiments that were expressed here is similar to what I have in mind uh, for the Board of Ed being the body, uh, some people that really, their job is to um, support policies and procedures and, and the budget, making sure that the budget is what it should be. Um, and, and again, Communication is what is, is needed, and, and I think that happens a lot. Uh, it's a must. It has to happen between, obviously, the, the administrators, the people that are running day-to-day -day activities in the school. So um, that's pretty much it that I have. Thank you. Okay, the next question. That seemed to work well. Ms. Barrett. 
the question is, and we have a, a mixture of questions tonight that are very generic and others that are specific concerns of the audience. And this is, this is probably one of the ones with a specific concern. Not to say it's any less of a community concern. Please grade the current programs to teach students with dyslexia, dysgraphia, and dys... Kakalia. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I learned something tonight. Ms. Burton, would you start? Well, this is a this is a crucial topic. We talked a lot about um, uh, the power of parents and community. Um, at every single board member meeting this year, we have had parents and students um, with dyslexia um, come and advocate. And I was one of the board members who absolutely fought hard until the last until the last breath of our budget to make sure that we reserved money for students with dyslexia, dyspraxia, dysgraphia. And um, it, is, it is long overdue. There are, there's all kinds of complicating reasons, including changes in state law, why um, we've, we've let off of that. If I had to give ourselves a grade right now, I'd give ourselves about a C minus. And that's not for trying. That is not a criticism of our staff. But we absolutely know right now that we have students who are under-identified, and we have students who we need to serve better. We need good, evidence-based, science-based programs for these kids. And just putting that money aside last year was the very first step. But our staff are working very hard. And this is not a criticism of our staff. We have a tremendous amount of catching up to do. And it's going to be a significant effort from our folks. And thank goodness for those dyslexia folks because the parents and the community members, they helped us, but they've also opened up conversations about additional reading resources and structured literacy so we can improve the reading programs um, for all of our kids. Thanks. Thank you. Dr. Miller. I got three now. Okay, so um, <laughs> I also agree. Um, I would say about, we're at about average right now, so I would say we're about C right now, but I would give us an A for effort, and I would give our dyslexia, decoding dyslexia group, an A for effort and for advocacy because they have really stepped up. And not only, um, it, it was an interesting way they presented it. We had children come and speak. We had children hand in their materials that they had written, um, and then they read it. And it was, it's amazing what their advocacy has done. And to, we did a board training on what it was like to be um, a student or a child with dyslexia. They came training for us, so we really have been trying to put ourselves in these family shoes and in these students' shoes because the reading is critical. You're learning to read and then you need to learn for the rest of your life. And that skill is absolutely 100% critical. We can't take advantage of all these opportunities and all these great things that we have been talking about if you don't have that basic foundation. It makes everything 100 times harder that they are doing in that classroom. So, no, we are not there yet. We are doing a lot better as far as identifying, as far as uh, facilitating the communication. Um, our, something that our special ed strategic work group is actually looking at how we facilitate those conversations and how we facilitate those trainings. Um, so it's, it, it is a work in progress. Thank you, Mr. Rayner. Thank you. Uh, over the course of the past eight months or so, since I found Mark the Board of Education, I've had the opportunity to visit and speak, I mean, goodness, hundreds of voters all in our, our large and, and beautiful county. And I can't tell you how many times I've been asked about programs for dyslexia and special education in general, to be frank with you. We are, as I said earlier, we're responsible to the general public and to the taxpayers. And I think it's wonderful. I've been on the other side of the dais addressing, um, not President Young years ago when I was in high school, I've spoken in front of there. I know how much it takes to get up there and advocate for your child or for your student at CPS, and I commend them all for that. Uh, in that case, I've, I've been enlightened and I'm an educator regarding this issue. I, I would generally concur with Dr. Miller and Ms. Barrett that we're about average, but I think, again, the most important thing is that we're continuing to recognize our faults and move forward as a school system. And I look forward, if elected, to continue to serve the needs of our dyslexic students while in office. Thank you. Mr. Young. Well, thanks for making me feel so old, Mr. Lee. <laughs> uh, I, I don't want to assess a grade in Frederick County. I'll address the address the grade as a state, I think we are probably at a C minus. And the reason I, I say as a state is our school system was kind of handcuffed with what state rules were and where things were. And we started to get the advocacy from the parents 
I have started to work with this, but some of those things change. So I'm going to give our uh, current effort an A as far as where we're moving. And I just got back this past week uh, from State Board of Education meeting down in Ocean City where uh, Board of Trustees, Board of Education members from all over the state got together. And I talked to a number of them. And what I can tell you is that Frederick County well, has a lot of work to go as far ahead of most counties in our state. And so I'm very proud of the work that we're doing to get better. But it's always a course of improvement. And I think we're doing the right things. As Ms. Barrett said last year, our board set aside money to start to address the problem, to start to tr train teachers in identification and put resources in place for students to be able to do that. It is very heart wrenching when you have young people come to our meeting and get up and speak and articulate what they're saying and then they show you what they've written and it doesn't even correspond to what they said. I mean that tugs at your heart. You really do know that it's an important issue and I think our board is addressing it. Ms. Young. So the pendulum in education always swings and then swings back. Um, about 20 years ago, I remember taking a course called Alpha Phonics, and it's what we did for our kids that were considered dyslexic, except as teachers we weren't allowed to make that diagnosis because that was a medical diagnosis. Things have changed. Um, that morphed into LSP, Learning Language Support Program, I believe. And then we all kind of started noticing how when those teachers were retiring, they were not replaced. And those programs kind of went. And I kind of was wondering with some of the other teachers, I wonder where they went to. We were assured, oh, needs were being addressed in other ways. The community didn't think so, so now the pendulum swings back. My one concern when things, the pendulum swings, is that we're now over-diagnosing students, and if they get a diagnosis of this, it's not necessarily going to address their needs. We're also sometimes handcuffing our special ed teachers who have, um, you know, some, they're trying something. I've talked to a lot of special ed teachers about this. If they're trying something that's not working, with some of the programs that are coming in now, you have to follow them uh, to a T for fidelity. So we have to be careful when we implement things that we're, the pendulum's not swinging back too far. If one thing worked for every student, we'd be doing that. So I want to see the needs of the dyslexic kids met, but not applied incorrectly. Thank you. Ms. Williams? Yes, thank you. Um, so I, I want to just talk about the special, special education programs, and I'm sure that we do quite a bit here in Frederick County to make sure that the needs of these students are met. But I don't really have much um, information, personal information, about the dyslexic, uh, dyslexia program and what we're doing to that. So I can't really honestly give a grade to what I think is going on. I, I really don't have enough information, personal information, to do that. So I'm going to be calling right, right now. OK. Thank you. Mr. Mason. I'm not going to grade my uh, fellow candidates, my incumbents up here. I don't want to, after getting get elected, I don't want to start, from, start off on a bad foot. Um, so I had a conversation recently with, uh, with a parent, and she, uh, she was dyslexic, and her now uh, fourth grader is dys 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 dyslexic, and wasn't diagnosed until second grade. She went out and got her own diagnosis from a qualified doctor, spent a couple thousand dollars on it, but it wasn't accepted. So from kindergarten, kindergarten to first grade, um, her student went undiagnosed. But she had proof that her child had dyslexia. Um, and I want to thank the dyslexic community for advocating for our students, because that's where it begins. If we don't have parents step up and advocate, we'll never know what the problem is. So if we can address the situation sooner in kindergarten, first grade, listen to our parents who know their child the best, and let them tell, tell us that they know their child's dyslexic. If they spent a couple thousand dollars on, on, a, on a doctor, we should be able to listen to that. There, there was no flexibility in her situation to allow her to have her child diagnosed in kindergarten, second grade, or kindergarten, first grade. So I think we need to, to open the dialogue, let our parents tell us as a school system about their child and what their situation is and how they can improve it. I guess I'll give you a C. Thank you. <laughs> okay, we're to our next question. It's kind of interesting standing up here and, uh, and watching here and watching there. And when that white card comes up, there's at least two or three candidates that look at me like, are you going to beat them soundly over the head and body? 
for going over in time. But they did a good job that time, and uh, I appreciate it. It's very hard to be in this forum, have ideas, and try to rush through and try to make your point. So well, we'll cut you a little slack, but here again, we still have more questions to get through. Um, Dr. Miller, I guess we'll start with you then this time. This is, a, this is very specific, and some candidates may be more qualified to answer it than another, but, but try. Um, the question is, will you require evidence of success for the LINCS program before expanding it? And I realize that's an opinion. Sure. Okay. Um, well, a couple things. One, I wanted to finish up my dyslexia thing. Um, at our board meeting tomorrow, <laughs> We are having, actually, it's Dyslexia Awareness Month, and we are having our, basically, report card on dyslexia. So, uh, tune in and watch the board meeting. Um, as far as links program, um, it's going to be really difficult to fully replicate links. But some of the ideas and some of the strategies behind links, we can go ahead and start uh, replicating. One is the, the mentorship. These students are being mentored uh, from their guidance counselors all the way down into middle school, and especially on the schools where we have the, the schools right next to each other on the same campus, that's a little bit easier to do. But having that, that again, that longitudinal, that vertical team from the middle school up to the high school and having that support is something that we could easily replicate in the rest of our, our schools. The other thing is the competency-based learning. The competency, 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 if I could learn to say it, that would be beautiful. But the competency-based learning is where they have a skill and they, they have these metrics that they use to show that they have learned that skill and they become, they get a course certification from it. We're doing it right now in a PE course, um, an art course, uh, and a music course where the students can show these competency base. So I definitely see that expanding to, to other schools. As far as being able to serve like breakfast, lunch, and dinner, being able to have the flexible schedules at other schools, that's going to be very, very difficult. Thank you. Thank you. Again, I, um, in my recent Fretcher News Post podcast interview, we asked a very similar question about the LINCS program. I will mostly concur with Dr. Miller on this. I think some of the ideas LINCS provides are kind of a bridge to where we're going in the next 20 or 30 years of public education, fundamentally more individualization of students' journey through public education. I understand the difficult to implement. I would personally I see our, our buildings as multifaceted. We are we are a public utility in our schools here. And it should be accessible at a more variety of times. I like to see more classes offered at a variety of times. That is challenging. But I think it's where we need to go to accommodate different academic pathways as we proceed into the coming years. Again, I think back to the accountability aspect of it, I think it'd be silly not to make sure we're holding programs accountable. I hope we do that for all our programs here in FCPS. But again, I'd like to see some of the ideas, the basic principles behind the links the individualism, the focus on a student's talents, and the more flexible way you can approach your high school education to continue, and ideally in all 10 of our high schools. Thank you. Mr. Young. To start with, Lynx is currently only in the freshman and sophomore class here at Frederick High. It'll take two more years before all four classes are fully exposed to it. The board at a recent board meeting got an update on what's been going on with Lynx. And one of the most interesting things uh, that I took out, and this is feeding back to Mr. Mason's comments about eliminating the achievement gap, since Lynx has been in place in those two classes, the average attendance rates of those classes has gone up. And most importantly, in those groups that we talked about that are underachieving, it went up even more. And so finding ways to make sure the students are engaged and want to come to school are important. Now it's also nice that you factor in, in that period that they've got a beautiful new building that's very nice to come into. I'm sure that played a role as well. But we have to find ways to make sure the students are engaged, they want to get up, they want to come to school, they want to learn, and understanding that many of our students have different needs. Some of our students have to work before they come to school. Some of our students work after school. Some of our students, again, have to work weekends. And so providing more flexibility to be able to deliver education to the needs of our students is one of the things that I think that we have to continually look at. I think Lynx does that, and we can expand those pieces of it through the rest of the county, but after evidence of success. Ms. Yoho. Definitely agree. You want to make sure something's working before you expand it. So I, I think that's a good way to look at it. Um, but I see that things change. 
and um, education in a lot of ways hasn't. And if you look at millennials, um, you know, TV is on demand. They're not going to just, it's there, they're not going to watch it, but they want to watch it when they want to watch it. Um, I don't know, you can think of a lot of different things that are now being done that way. My, my own children, uh, two of them work at Social Security Administration. They sometimes work at home, sometimes work um, in the office. They keep three days in the office, so they keep a desk. Some people don't, and they'll have rotating cubicles. So we have to look at how can we keep up with change that's positive and beneficial to our students. Um, and I, I think uh, if it is successful, it would be great to uh, expand it. Thank you, Ms. Williams. Yes, sir, thank you. Um, so I, I believe that I support the delivering of the individualized the special programs, but, um, and like Karen said, uh, things are changing uh, constantly. And, um, uh, and once we get them here, teaching them, having them learn in the ways that are special to them, expand on that once it's proven to to be working and going in the, in the right direction. Thank you. Mr. Mason. The challenge of uh, public education is taking 43,000 students and finding out what works best for each and every single individual student because they're all different. I so I'm over here door knocking on Bed Street talking to a uh, parent and I asked them about the late program and to my surprise, was not very happy with it. So we cannot expand it before we figure out how, uh, how successful it's going to be. He had to go out and hire a tutor for his, uh, for his daughter for algebra. So he was not very, very positive about the LATES program. It's not going to work for everybody, but we've got to make sure that it does work before we expand it. Ms. Barrett. So uh, I had like 2,968 questions about the LATES program because it, it came really fast. So there was a lot of impetus, impetus at the state level, and there, I mean, there's many people in this room who have worked in public education for a long time, and there's always something new and better. Um, and I think this constant uh, steamroller of reform is overwhelming, and it, it does a disservice. But I'm going to say this about the LINCS program. Uh, Mr. Mason made a great point about trying to figure out what works best for everybody. But here are some critical parts of the LINCS program. Three meals a day. A lot of one-on-one -on -one connection with adults. Mentorships, small groups, field trips, connections to your own community. More small groups, discussions about current issues, schedule flexibility. So if I had to take most Frederick County Public students and I had to take a small group of them, those core elements, I think, work because education is intended to be personal. It's intended to sort of serve that whole person that we talked about. Now, the complicating thing is that- Now's gonna be wrapping it up. All right. Day. So, I think we've got challenges with scheduling, competency-based learning to figure out. Thank you. Thank you. I have no idea what time it is. No one's fallen asleep out there yet, so I guess we're okay for a little longer. Since this is a PTA program, I, this question is probably one of the more pertinent ones. And uh, we'll start with Mr. Rayner on this. How do you plan to get the community more involved in making sure education in Frederick County continues to improve? That is a phenomenal question. Given the Board of Education, uh, when you go to vote, is the very last phrase on the ballot, that is, a, that is atrocious, given the amount of of fiscal responsibility the Board of Education has in Frederick County. Roughly half the county budget is administered by the Board of Education. We are arguably, in my opinion, certainly on par with the county council in terms of the effect we're going to have on the daily lives of people who live in Frederick County. Again, I look to, to um, people like my, my good friend Mr. Mason and myself who, who, who step up and have certain constituencies and, and values they want to bring to the public in the public discussion. One of the reasons for instance, one of the reasons I ran was to because I believe we need community engagement in SCPS in Frederick County. Again, I think part of it is to be the kind of person who can work well with people. I welcome and encourage debate and dissent. Of course, something we should be teaching our students as well to have a constructive com conversation and take criticism. And that's how we're going to move forward in Frederick County. So again, fostering the relationships and the culture that encourages um, parents and community members to go to Board of Education meetings and to vote and to 
where they try to go to your, uh, your students' uh, parent-teacher conference. And being active, an active member and participant in your child's education, you're only one half of how a child gets to the finish line. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Young. Community engagement and involvement was one of the big issues that I had on my plate when I first ran in 2010. Uh, and when I got on the board, everything, every major decision that we made, I wanted to make sure that we had plenty of community input. Frederick High is a great example. I knew when we got the report that said, let's tear down the existing building and build a new one, both my parents were Frederick High graduates, that that wasn't going to fly over real well without community engagement. And we brought, as a school system, the community together to make the decision, and it worked really well. I try to be active and get out in all the schools throughout the county to, to be uh, out in the community where people know that they can come up to me and talk about issues that are going on in our school system. I attended all 17 graduations this past spring from our high schools to Success to Rock Creek to Evening High School, Flexible Evening High School and Summer School. And so uh, I try to be present and make sure that people know they have an ear if they email or they get an answer back, if they call, my phone number's there, they can call me. I think it's important that we make sure our community knows that it's their school system, these are their buildings, they own them, we want them involved in making sure we continue to have a great school system. Thank you, Ms. Yo. Before I was a teacher in the system, um, I was a parent. Um, I substituted, I was a PTA president three times, the first time I was going to be a PTA president talking in front of an audience at Green Valley Elementary scared me for a year and a half before I had to do it. Then I got in you know, where I could do it without passing out and I began to advocate and I started going to school board meetings and I remember then getting to know some of the personnel very well and knowing they were listening to me and feeling very empowered and um, well, I won't even tell you what one Dr. Gadger used to call some of the parents. We were a little maybe too pushy, but, um, but he was a very nice man and helped us a lot. But having that influence and feeling like we were being heard, I've been there. Uh, it's very important. You can either make top-down decisions and then not live well with the consequences because everybody's ready to uh, revolt, or you can start smartly and start with the community and make sure it's a ground-up decision that everybody can support. Even if they don't support it completely, they'll understand how you arrived at the answer. Thank you, Ms. Williams. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, community involvement, so critically important. Um, I came here from Montgomery County. We moved here in 1991. Our oldest son was in fourth grade. I was very involved down in Montgomery County. The PTA, I was PTA president down there. I've always been the type of person to get involved. And I think that just speaks to um, what I wanted to do for my children and, and, and again, be there for the other children in the school. Um, it's, it's been a lifetime of, for me, uh, public service of gratitude. Uh, I have nothing, of, I've never wanted to be a teacher, not by profession, but um, since my children were born, my husband and I, we were their first teachers. So um, I, I just really feel very strongly in uh, being advocates for children. My, my own children, other children, um, I walk up the street, down the street, people talk to me, I'm in the grocery store, I'm at Rita's, and they're like, hey, I saw you on a blah, 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 and a blah, 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 and well, you know, I really love to talk, and, um, uh, but more important, uh, importantly than talking is listening to what people have to say, oh, okay, what people have to say, so I, I, I do enjoy that, but, but again, I, the reason I'm running is because we want Frederick County to have the best public school education for our children. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Mason. Community involvement, community engagement is what led me to this seat right here. Uh, when I uh, <coughs> finished my master's degree in 2012, like I said before, I joined the Eliminating Achievement Gaps organization. I eventually joined the SHIP board, um, joined the United Way board, I'm currently on the Boys and Girls Club and have that board. I've been on the uh, Affordable Housing Council for the county which led me to being on the education leadership team for County Executive Jan Gardner, which then eventually got me on to her little Frederick Steering Committee. So, I know my county, I, I'm in real estate, I understand the 
the, uh, the, the problems with affordable housing. Uh, we, all, we, we all want to live, work, and play here. So I've, I've been engaged in my community, and I talk to people wherever I go to try to get them engaged in the community. I'm also in the Rotary, and what we do is give back to the community. So everything I'm about is being engaged in this community. So when I talk to people out, uh, door knocking or on the street, I talk to them about just being involved in this great community that we live in and enjoying everything that we have to offer here in Frederick County. Thank you, Ms. Barrett. Ms. Williams had a great point about the importance of listening, and I think um, my commitment is really to listen. And I think as a school system, we talk about grading the dyslexia program. That was a question. Well, you know, we're talking about a C grade or something like that, but we're talking about individual children. And we're talking about parents who've given up hours and hours to come give public testimony to impact the budget and the priorities of the board. I'm a special education parent myself, and it is grueling and exhausting. And when other parents fall down, we all have to stand up for them and carry them along and, and advocate for our own children and their children. And uh, I've been an advocate for a long time, but you know, we can't, we can always celebrate the success of the school system. And that's one of my jobs as a board member. But I very much believe that as we celebrate our success and we celebrate all the good things, that we must have the challenging conversations. We've got to lay it all out there and say, the only way people feel heard is for you to acknowledge that there are problems and that we have to improve things. Does that mean we have a failing school system? Absolutely not. We have a tremendous school system with tremendous people who are working hard. But we must listen to people and do better. And I'm absolutely committed. And the white card just went off, and I am done. <laughs> Thank you. Dr. Miller. This has been one of the main pillars of my platform since 2010 when I started this job. It is the critical piece for to be a listener, to listen to the community, and then to be that the voice of the community on the board. That is what I have tried to do. Every single decision that I made has been focused on that, on community input. First of all, I think when we're talking about listening, we have to make sure our board room is welcoming. We have to make sure it's welcoming for public comment, that we're not threatening, um, that, we're, that we listen to all sides. Uh, we have people that take very passionate, very different positions on different issues. We have to make sure that all are welcome in our boardroom. It is critical in this country that we set the example right now. We set the example for our students and we set the example for our community that all voices will be welcome. Everyone has a seat at the table. We, I will tell you in our work sessions, we will actually bring people up to the table. Sometimes it embarrasses them, but we will bring them up to the table, sit right beside us. Let's talk this out. Let's talk about the the whatever situation is had. Sometimes they go beyond their three to five minutes. Our public comment lasts sometimes forever. But we sit there and we want to hear. Our only my only thing is I can't have back and forth with them because I really value not only just the listening but then also the conversation to making sure that they were here, that they were heard and that I did hear what they were saying. The other thing is we everything that we have done we've tried to do a community engagement opportunity. We want to have those decisions that we're making about building this new high school, about whether we built Sugarloaf first or Butterfly Ridge first, any of those decisions decisions that we make that are so critical and so important to our community, that we make sure that we have that community input, and that was just because of the card that's why I made that face. So that is actually has been a complete and utter focus of mine, is how we increase that community input. Thank you. Uh, I'm told that our time is up for this evening. It went, went very quickly. Uh, I think all of you have a much better insight into the quality of candidates that we have. I, myself, am very impressed. We have seven very motivated and uh, dedicated people who want to make our school system the best that it can be. So I thank them. I thank them not just for showing up tonight, but through going through all the, the hassles, the questionnaires, and everything else that you have to do as a candidate. I know firsthand that is not the fun part at all, but uh, we certainly are very grateful that you've decided to do that. And uh, like I said, I'm very impressed with the quality of your answers and, uh, and the quality of your candidacy. Uh, before we go, I do want to thank uh, Tracy uh, Tatum and uh, her committee and our timers for working this out tonight. Uh, it worked very well. Uh, we have a couple extra seats, but uh, the people that were here, I think, uh, think got a lot out of it. So thank you to them and thank you to our candidates. Good night.